Hello and welcome to Showcase, TRT World's flagship arts and culture program. Today, we'll introduce you to a Japanese artist who is blowing up the art world one creature at a time. We'll also head to Paris, where people are banking on the popularity of a new museum, which literally has a lot of currency. And saving the US president, we'll speak with a movie critic about the latest installment of the blockbuster Fallen franchise, but first. Insiders take to the stage at the Sarajevo Film Festival to tell the audience how they're shaping the future of Bosnia's motion picture industry. Metal is a magical material um, and it's so versatile and beautiful. We're spending the day with the next generation of silversmiths to find out how this everyday metal is being modernized. The art of manipulating and shaping metal is centuries old. The techniques, whether it's a pair of earrings or a suit of armor, all come from the same silversmithing traditions. But in these days of mass production, silversmithing has become a rare craft. And that's where Bishop's Land Educational Trust comes in. It offers residency courses in the hopes of keeping this ancient craft alive. But is it working? We sent showcases Miranda Atti to find out. Bishop's Land Educational Trust is set in the heart of the British countryside. Its mission is simple, train the next generation of silversmiths and jewellers and equip them with the skills to be able to sell their own creations, whatever they may be. It was set up by Penelope Makawa and her husband Oliver. The universities don't really do what we're doing in the way of teaching for silver. Now, now I've come away from the, the workbench, very sorry to her, but in a way it's more important to help the young people and give them a career in life that they're really passionate about. The Trust was set up 26 years ago by Penelope and Oliver and since then it's grown exponentially. The current intake number 14 self-employed makers who spend 12 months eating, sleeping and breathing right here in Bishop's Land. Because it's a residency programme, the students spend the entire year focused on nothing but their craft. Today they're getting a special masterclass from Bishop's Land Fellow and Didi Akubia. She was one of the students in 1997 and has since become one of the most successful silversmiths in the UK, even being awarded an MBE honour from the Queen. Ndidi is teaching her students hammering techniques. Every maker I've ever met has their way of doing things. So even though they may have been taught in a traditional way, they have adapted or um, moved the designs or moved the making into something to tell their story, whatever that is. I think people just uh, like to have objects that, I don't know, um, mean something to them. With only a few months of their course left, the students have begun to develop their own styles. I think it's so important for me to be here because that gives you the opportunity to develop um, my own style. So I've sort of, you, we've learned so many more. We've had lots of master classes where we can, there's things that I didn't have the time to do when I was at university, like engraving and chasing the pousse and um, raising. As a maker, I'm kind of a romantic storyteller. The narrative is still very important. So my background, the kind of conceptual background is there. Um, and I really try to catch uh, memories, try to catch uh, forgotten stories, things that tend to fade in time. And um, I really want to help 
people uh, carry those precious moments. Well, I'm quite interested in doing kind of these fabricated forms at the moment, which are made from a uh, silver sheet. So at the moment, I'm just trying to flatten off all these sides because we're heating them so much, they kind of tend to warp. So there's quite a lot of work involved in kind of trying to file them really flat and straight. And I'm quite interested in these kind of minimalistic forms that are quite kind of clean and sharp. Metalwork is an ancient craft, and like many other traditional crafts, it's at risk of falling out of favour as technology develops. But with silversmithing, the joy is in the fact that each piece is unique. Former student Rachel Jones now works part-time as the workshop manager. With silversmithing, you are always learning. There's so many techniques, and there are lots of experts out there. Um, but there are few that are absolute masters. And Bishop's Land always strives to have those teach the next generation of silversmiths. So we do masterclasses with chasing, repousse, um, engraving, enamelling, you know, all those key skills that aren't taught in university anymore. Organisations like Bishop's Land are rare. It's a charity and most of the students attending do so via scholarships. The fellows are often invited back to teach and to help new graduates. Since it launched 26 years ago, around 200 silversmiths from all over the world have been through its doors. New technologies may jeopardize traditional silversmithing, but places like Bishop's Land are determined to keep this ancient craft alive. Miranda Atty, TRT World, Dunstan, South Oxfordshire. Showcase continues its coverage from the 25th edition of the Sarajevo Film Festival. Today, we look at how it's helping shape the country's film industry. Of course, the festival attracts cinephiles from around the world, but it's also a crucial meeting place for newbie filmmakers as well as seasoned industry players. And it's the event's ability to create this international dialogue that has become a game changer for the Balkan film industry. Showcase's Alijan Pamir was on location to hear firsthand what they had to say. In its 25th edition, the Sarajevo Film Festival brought filmmakers and creative thinkers together to help improve global creative cultural dialogue in a much grander transnational scale. Below me right now lies the city of Sarajevo, a culture capital of the Balkans. Be it arts, food or history, the city offers the best there is. And today, we'll take you to the heart of its exciting movie culture. One panel which got that heartbeat stronger was the Balkan Advanced Music Group's discussion on creative cities. This event, consisting of idea people from different disciplines, explained to its guests that it is the multicultural film and art environments of cosmopolitan cities that allow them to get noticed in the international arena. And in the case of Sarajevo, it's the movie festival which helps in putting the Bosnian capital on that map. From the beginning, from the end of the war until now, uh, I think this is, uh, this is the, like one of the most beautiful events where you can see that Sarajevo is completely becomes a very cosmopolitan place. People are able to, um, on a more personal level, interact with one another. And they're able to break barriers that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to break in other places. Emerging as one of the most innovative of transnational cinema promoters, TRT brought to the festival their highly respectable 12 Punto platform, which has been garnering critical acclaim from top international filmmakers, seeking trustworthy collaborators to assist them in realizing their dreams. The hungry Sarajevo audience were introduced to TRT's groundbreaking program, which values the vision of filmmakers first and foremost. One of the lack side of Turkish cinema, I think, and we believe that, uh, is we are not starting to, to promote our projects from the beginning. 
We are dealing so much things as a director producer. We are dealing and struggling so much things from during the production, during the post production. And whenever they are done, and they start to promote their movies, and they are trying to put their movies in international areas. But I think it's a mistake. As you see in the Sarajevo Film Festival, there's a huge session which is called CineLink, which is starting, uh, which is match, matching, matchmaking with the producers and directors and from the, all over the world, producers and directors and TV stations and uh, big producers. And uh, I think we are missing that. Uh, from that perspective, we started to make a product project which is called TRT 12 Punto uh, Script Days. This project is, uh, enables us to choose the projects which has potential internationally. And uh, when we are making this, we are choosing the projects from the beginning. Because it's important to choose from the beginning. The younger generation that represent the future of movie culture are also present in Sarajevo. Filmmakers Lukas Gravis and Vera Coolidge being two distinguished names. The student short film segment allows these up-and-coming artists to find their perfect audience. First of all, it's a good chance to show the film in a live audience that you don't know, so you can sort of check reactions and see uh, what the end product basically has as an um, output. And also I see myself less as an artist and film less as art, so I think a festival is more a place where you can uh, go to meetings, see films, meet other people and uh, like this build a sort of agenda and um, a calendar with people with who you can work with in the future later. Um, by being here I get a sense of achievement and I uh, get the live reaction of the audience that are not my friends and family but people I don't know. So that's a good feeling, yeah. And I plan on going here next year, the Ensemble International Festival. And it's exactly this kind of culturally diverse atmosphere, which also values open discussion and the younger generations, that allows Sarajevo Film Festival to shape the future of Bosnian cinema. Alijan Pamir, TRT World, Sarajevo. Still to come on Showcase, it's an art form that's not just full of hot air. Are these sculptures just another party trick? Matsumoto Masayoshi doesn't think so, as he twists the lines between novelty and art. So, I got you. Going under. Dive deep. Gerard Butler returns to save the day once again in the third installment of the Fallen franchise. The art of money. We head to Paris, where a new museum is exploring the global economy. Well, you all know the saying, money makes the world go round. But while that might be true, it's also an unlikely subject for an art show. But now, a former bank in France has become the home to an exhibition exploring the history of currency, from banknotes to Bitcoin. This 19th century sumptuous neo-Renaissance palace in Paris is attracting visitors with a different kind of currency banking knowledge by understanding and grasping how the economy works. Economic culture is essential. It's true that the French are known to have very limited economic knowledge, even less when it comes to finances. And in our financialized economies, it's a handicap not to have the basics. The museum has many exhibits, including this, the negotiating table where users can write a global accord on cutting carbon emissions, all to make the visitor contemplate the domino effect one financial decision can have on others and also on the economy. The economy is not a series of opinions. There are things we know. When demand increases while supply does not, well, prices will rise. And that's a law. It's not something you can argue against. 
However, some feel that while politics is usually a core part of running a nation, nowadays money is the deciding factor. The political debate is essentially economic now. When we talk about Europe, we're talking about money. How much does Europe cost? How much does it cost us? So we need to be able to detect lies. And we have to understand that not everything is possible. The purpose of this exhibition is not for visitors to walk out as financial experts, but to perhaps inspire thoughts about the economy and whether consumers make rational choices. This exhibition is a tough sell, and perhaps the biggest question will be if the $13 entry fee was money well spent. It all began with Olympus has fallen. Then came London has fallen, and now hitting theatres is Angel has fallen. Scottish actor Gerard Butler is back as Secret Service agent Mike Benning will speak to a film critic to see if he thinks the third instalment lives up to the hype. But first, here is a sneak peek. You must really like fishing, Mr. President. <laughs> it's cold out here. Sorry. After serving as vice president in the previous film, we now see Alan Trumbull, played by Morgan Freeman, as the president of the United States. I'll give him my best shot, sir. Gerard Butler, as agent Mike Manning, accompanies him, and it doesn't take long for things to get out of hand. Are they bats? The drones, the drones! Running, sprinting, diving off the boat as it blows up into the water, coming up with them in the water, having to push them under again. I'm like, I, I, you know, I, I was definitely worried that I might accidentally kill Morgan Freeman. But in the end, it was kind of the opposite. I actually had to ask him to slow down something because he would run so fast. He's a big, he's like six foot three, six foot four or something. He's way taller than he, see, I was surprised when I first met him how, how tall he is. <laughs> The two actors, along with their other co-stars, including Jada Pinkett Smith, showed up in Los Angeles for the film's premiere. Smith plays FBI agent Helen Thompson in the action thriller. She's after Banning, who ends up getting framed for the attempted assassination of the president. Can't you see that I'm being set up? And what I really love about this particular role is that um, it's a female role that's head of the FBI and that this little old me, this little little petite lady is chasing down big old Mike Banning. <laughs> you have a collect call from Mike. In order to clear his name, Banning is forced to go against his own agency and FBI as he turns to unlikely allies to uncover the real threat. Safe. They're going to try and finish the job. He gets to be, on the one hand, very vulnerable in, in, in some ways and, um, and also incredibly brutal and vengeful. There's a lot of different sides to him and I get, uh, you, you know, and, and his humour I love. So it, it's just fun to kind of go on a ride with him in these journeys. We gotta get out of here. I ain't going nowhere. And it's been a long ride. Ever since the franchise kicked off in 2013, it's been slammed for its jingoism. But you. Angel Has Fallen stands out, according to some critics, who argue the anti-Trump sentiment has even seeped into the DNA of the Hollywood action movie. For more on Angel Has Fallen, let's cross over to North Carolina, where the managing director of Cinema Blend, Sean O'Connell, joins us now. Hi, Sean. So there are a lot of bad reviews on the internet about this movie. What do you think? Did you like it? Did you enjoy it? I actually did enjoy it, and I'm comparing it primarily to the one that came right before it, which is London Has Fallen, which to me was really bad. And so this is an improvement over that. Maybe that helped me enjoy it more than I normally would have. I'm a little bit surprised that this franchise has gotten to the point where we have three films, but you know, you get surprised by what types of films turn into franchises. Back when this first movie came out in 2013, uh, Olympus Has Fallen, it was competing against a rival uh, White House in Peril movie called White House Down by Roland Emmerich. And I would have bet at that time, because that film had Channing Tatum and Jamie Foxx, 
that that would be the one that would produce sequels, but people didn't really respond to that one. Audiences didn't turn out for it. They instead got behind Gerard Butler, and here we are several years later checking out the continued adventures of Mike Banning, and I thought this most recent chapter was a pretty good installment. Now, as uh, this franchise is about saving the U.S. president, I have to ask this question to you. Do you see any anti-Trump sentiment in this one? <laughs> no, and that would have been an easy target to go after for sure. But in this universe, uh, we have seen some continuity where Aaron Eckhart played a president who was a lot more um, Barack Obama-esque, I would say. It almost like Aaron Eckhart was playing Obama on screen. But he's been transitioned over to Morgan Freeman, of course, the beloved actor who's been part of this franchise, uh, first as Secretary of the State and then as Vice President. He now gets to be president in this film, and it's very clearly a Morgan Freeman type world leader. Um, stoic, reserved, intelligent. So again, none of the words that we would necessarily use to describe our current president. And how about Gerard Butler? How do you find him as an action star? One thing that he does in this film that I really appreciate, and I think that this what is what helps make the film so enjoyable, is that he plays Mike Banning as very vulnerable. Uh, from the, I think the first scene where we catch up with Mike Banning, his character, he's at a doctor's office, and the doctor is basically saying to him, listen, due to the last two films that you've endured, you're in bad shape. You know, you're really beat up, and you can't withstand this type of punishment. Which is really funny, because coming off of a movie like Hobbs and Shaw, uh, the Fast and Furious spinoff, which is in theaters as well, you see The Rock and Jason Statham as these truly unstoppable action heroes. Nothing can can damage them, and that becomes boring to me after a while. When your action hero uh, has no limits whatsoever in terms of what they can pull off, I tend to check out because there's no tension or drama. But the way Gerard Butler plays the hero in the Has Fallen uh, franchise you actually kind of believe by the end of the movie that he might not make it. And that, to me, is always more interesting than just having a sort of robotic CGI hero who can't be stopped by anything. And um, Sean, one more question quickly before we wrap up. Has this been sure. a good um, summer blockbuster season overall, you think? If you like sequels um, and franchises, yes, it's been great. Toy Story 4, obviously Avengers Endgame, uh, Men in Black International. But if you're looking for original fare, no, it's been um, a struggle to find movies that we can celebrate that are not already recognizable titles. Uh, and, and listen, audiences are voting with their dollars. They want to see sequels. They want to see more of the same. But I'm looking forward to getting into the fall season, the quote unquote Oscar season where original ideas uh, and strong directors uh, with great talent starts to rise to the, uh, the top of the surface. Well, let's see what the next season will bring. Sean O'Connell, thank you for your analysis as always. Always a pleasure. That's it on Showcase today. Don't forget, you can access all of our stories on our YouTube channel. But before we go, back in 2013, artist Jeff Koons earned $58.4 million for his balloon dog sculpture, no longer seen as merely party objects by the art world, and following on the heels of Kuhn's comes artist Matsumoto Masayoshi. Here, he shows us that the balloon art bubble has a long way to go before it bursts. I'm Ilf Berketli. Bye for now. <laughs>